10. The baseball had an 18. Tonight, the final game of the third week of the NFL player strike, the Denver Broncos and the Los Angeles Raiders. And for Bronco fans in this football crazed city, it's a strange moment. At another time, on a different occasion, tonight's expected crowd of 50 to 55,000, the largest of the NFL weekend, would be wild-eyed with anticipation. But with few exceptions, can these be the much despised Raiders? And for that matter, with only a few exceptions, are these our Broncos? The fans can only hope that the excitement that always attends a Raider Bronco game will be here tonight. <laughs> From Denver, Colorado, it's the Los Angeles Raiders and the Denver Broncos. This ABC Sports exclusive is brought Good players have been added, Bill Pickell and Howie Long. On the other side, we've got the Denver Broncos, 1-1-1. One, one, and one. They've had four players come in this week that are going to help them. They're going to counter Long and Pickell with a couple linemen, Dave Stutter, Billy Bryan. Steve Watson at wide receiver. They got whitewashed, though, by Houston last week, 40-10. to 10. Danny Reeves promises that his ball club's not that bad. They'll play a lot better tonight. And it is a very enthusiastic crowd. It's difficult to estimate how many people are here. You can't tell how many seats were turned back, but last week they had 38,000, which is about half of capacity. And it looks like we have at least that many tonight and probably more. Tom Flores of the undefeated Raiders, and the Raiders and the Chicago Bears right now are the only undefeated teams in the NFL. And Dan Reeves, whose team comes in with a mark of 1-1-1. One, one, and one. They won their opener over Seattle, were tied by Green Bay, then the strike and last week's loss to Houston. David Hardy kicking off for the Raiders, and Shane Swanson is back deep along with LaRon Brown for Denver. And this is Shane Swanson from the one. 
And he comes back out to the 22-yard line. And decibel-wise, as far as the crowd is concerned, these might as well be the real Broncos and the real Raiders. But instead of Elway, for Denver, it's Ken Karcher out of Tulane. He was in Denver's camp last year, didn't make the team. And he was in New Orleans' camp this fall and didn't make the team. Bobby Michaud has NFL experience. And Joe Dudek signed by the team this week. He was injured all of last year. Then Stuttered and Bryan are two regular Broncos at left tackle and at center. First and 10, Denver from the 22-yard line. Karcher, the quarterback. Karcher and a busted play to begin things. Rick Ackerman made the tackle. So we begin with a busted play as you take a look at the Raider defense now. The two familiar ones, Long and Fakel with Ackerman, the right end, they play the 3-4. Cormier, Kimmel, Washington, and Goodlow are the linebackers. And then the secondary, the unrelated Hills, Rod and Greg, Eddie Anderson and Ron Foster are the safety men. Second down and 15 from the 17-yard line. That's Nathan Poole, and he too has prior Bronco experience from years back in the backfield. As Karcher throws, and incomplete. Mitch Andrews, the intended receiver, and hit hard by Ron Foster, and a penalty marker is down. And I think Howie Long has drawn a holding call already. He's going to work tonight against Keith Kartz, the right tackle, and there's the big underarm. And look at Kartz, how he has his right arm underneath Long's throat, and... Granted, you don't want the big guy to get to your quarterback, but that, that ain't going to get he a try. Third down. If you're going to have just somebody return, it could be the best man you have come back. It would be Howie Long, because not only will he work on the left side, they can move him in the Raiders' defensive scheme of thing all along that line of scrimmage, and they'll do just that, and they'll find some spot where he'll be going against an inexperienced man. He's clearly the most dominant football player on the field tonight. Fred Silva, the referee tonight, third and 15, Denver from the 17-yard line. Karcher protected well and throwing the bomb, and it's caught by Steve Watson, another regular Bronco at the 30-yard line. And Rod Hill and really just stopped him in his tracks. Watson five yards past him, and this is exactly what Dan Reeves wants to see early. First and 10 at the 33-yard line. And through the middle, that's Joe Dudek out of Little Plymouth State in New Hampshire, whose big claim to fame is he was the cover boy on Sports Illustrated as they heralded Dudek and said, what about Dudek for the Heisman a couple of years ago? Well, what about his college career, Al? I mean, the guy scored 79 touchdowns at Plymouth State, rushed for over 5,500 yards, a 7.1 yard per carry average in college football. Now, granted, it was Division Three, but still, those are big-time numbers. More important, he was cut in the last cut by Denver. He knows the offensive scheme of things of Danny Reeves. On second and seven, incomplete. Mitch Andrews, again the intended receiver, and Ron Foster, a rookie, and a flag down, and a fight breaks out. Two penalty markers, in fact. And Billy Bryan is involved in that one, along with Daryl Bird, one of the linebackers. Daryl Bird, number 50, is a guy that's been around. He's a veteran with the Raiders. He wears a Super Bowl ring. He was with the Raiders back in 83 and 84, and Two veterans going at it early. Personal foul. Unsportsmanlike conduct. Number 50. He's disqualified. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Thrown out. Ooh, he's out of In here. In other words, yeah. Goodbye. Fred Phil colored on the left side, and they have really got into Donnybrooks over the years. First down from the 15-yard line. After the disqualification, and this is Dudek. And Dudek fights his way inside the 10 to the 8-yard line. And the way was led by Rick Massey, the wide receiver who scored a touchdown last week, throwing the block for Dudek. And that's the one thing that we know Joe Dudek can do, and that's run and run hard. If he has one failing as a professional football player, he's not a very good pass receiver. But this is exactly what he does well. But look at the blocking up front. 
and down in close. He gets away from one man right here, puts the nose down, knows the goal line isn't that far away, and gets the most he can out of it inside the 10-yard line. Second down and three. Broncos, this is the opening drive of the game. The big play, the 50-yard pass to Steve Watson. That's Massey in motion. Dudek again, inside the five, and touchdown. Lead guard pulled from the right guard position, and he got the kick out block that made it possible. Mike Clendenin to do the kicking. And so the Broncos go all the way down the field. A long pass to Watson, a Raider linebacker thrown out, and Joe Dudek scores his first NFL touchdown. A good look at the right guard, Winford Hood, reads upfield, comes up, drops the Raider to the ground. Denver, 7 0 early. In the first quarter last week, most people thought Denver would beat Houston. Instead, the Oilers won it 40 to 10. And Dan Reeves, as up front a guy as you'll find, said, My fault. Blame me. I didn't have him prepared. And they need this game. They do not want to fall two and a half games behind the Raiders, which is what would happen with a Raider victory tonight. So it's a uh, it's somewhat of a desperate Denver Broncos squad here tonight. One, two, and one does not sound very attractive. They'd be two and a half back, and remember the season already down to 15 games, so 11 to go after this evening. Glenn Denon to kick off. And for the Raiders, it's Rick Calhoun from the goal line. Back of Harrison. He passes him the 30, the 40, and a good run back to near midfield. Stopped at the 49-yard line by the kicker, Glenn Denon. Let's take a look at Joe Dudek's crisper execution offensively. And if it didn't work for Danny the first week, it certainly was a beautiful thing to watch on that particular play. And a familiar face and figure, and Vince Evans, the quarterback from the 49-yard line, and through the middle goes Ethan Horton for a gain of about four. Now, let's take a look at these Raiders. It was Evans, and remember, Mark Wilson crossed the line. He is here and on the bench, but Wilson only held last week. As Evans gets the call. And Ethan Horton, there is Mark Wilson. He could play tonight. He could quarterback tonight, but Evans did the, did the job. As Mark looks on with a, a yawn from the 47 yard line, it is intercepted by KC Clark. And Clark is out in front inside the 30, the 20, and bumped out by the last man, Vince Evans. And a first and ten Denver at the 43-yard line. And it's Dudek. Dudek fumbling the football. And Fred Silva's there to say Raiders have the football. So they get it right back. Dudek, after scoring the touchdown, coughed it up. And it's Rick Ackerman, number 60, who comes up with the recovery. Rick Ackerman from Memphis State has given it back to the Raiders and quiets the crowd. Dudek had an opening over the left side. He was really hammered as he started looking for that end zone, and Ackerman was all over. Let's take a look at it again with the reverse angle. Dudek, I think, thought he had another big hole like he had before, Dan, and was just nailed right there. Well, he's hit right in the middle. That time, Jimmy Ellis, the inside linebacker, puts his hat right on the football, and Dudek, who's really not known as a fumbler, has it pop right out. Ellis, a 10th round pick of the Raiders this past year, and he was cut in preseason. The Raiders, of their 45 men tonight, have 24 of them that have been with them either in camp or have been on their roster. They know the system both offensively and defensively, perhaps better than that of Denver. First and 10, Raiders from their own 16-yard line. Broncos lead 7-0 early in the first period. Ethan Horton, he's big at 6'4" and 220 pounds out of North Carolina. Now let's take a look at the Raiders offensively with Evans the quarterback. Rob Harrison and Ethan Horton are the running backs. Akins and Williams are the wideouts and Perry is the tight end. And there are the guys up front. Barry Black 
number 67, a left guard as a kid, lived in Santa Rosa, California, where the Raiders used to train, and Dave Dolby used to sneak him into practice. He grew up dreaming about becoming a Raider. He made it. From the 22-yard line. On second and four, Evans gets protected and hits Harrison, and Harrison moves it out to the 25-yard line, close to a first down, but a little bit short. It'll be third and one. Now the Denver defense, Boyer was with the team, so he crossed over. Tupper and Bryan, the three-man front. Then Joyner win. Jim Ryan, one of the regular Broncos. He crossed the line before last week's game but didn't play. And there's the secondary. Still no Louis Wright. <laughs> strike or no strike. <laughs> and to no one's surprise, it's a huge Raider offensive line up front. Four 280s and one 290. It's just business as usual with the silver and black. And this offensive line has played very good football. No sacks last week. Almost a seven yard per rush average. Third down and one from the 25 yard line. And not getting the first down is Ethan Horton. Tried to pick a hole, find one, and it never opened for him. And unless they give him a fabulous spot, he appears to be shy. Fabulous spot. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Not very popular here in Denver. It's like a tie goes to the runner. If, if that the ball and the uh, and the stick are even, it's a first down. Raiders. There it is, first two games with the regular guys, then last week. And your average through three at 205. A lot of that reflective of that big offensive line that Dan was talking about a moment ago, particularly over the right side with Wilkinson and Wright. Craig Ellis now in the game as a running back. Off the play fake. Evans nearly has that one picked off by Bryant Wynn. Number 55 out of the University of Houston. Then Sevens, the quarterback of the Raiders, jobs, and he settled on the Raiders, and he might possibly be their quarterback when they come back to regular play. Second down and 10, and stopped again is Horton, and it's Steve Bryan with some help from Jim Ryan. Steve Bryan just working in from his right defensive end position. His older brother is Rick Bryan, the number one draft choice of the Atlanta Falcons from the University of Oklahoma that's where Steve played collegiately as well and Dan Reeves said that this is a guy who has a real chance to stick if and when the strike comes to a conclusion that Steve Bryan's a guy that might make his ball close. third down and 12 under nine minutes to play in the first period seven nothing Denver Evan flush gets it away and throws it out of bounds. He's very mobile and he's very elusive and it was all he can do to turn that into an incompletion as he was chased down by Jeff Tupper. He'll give you a throw choices early. Vince Gamash to do the kicking and Shane Swanson to receive. He's back at his own 35. The rush was on. The kick is short. The kick is a real bad one. And there's a flag down. Did Fred Silva pick up his flag? I. And it could have been that somebody touched the ball. Yeah, that's the ball what happened. Was deflected, that's what you he, can run into that punter. He threw his flag and then picked it back up again. Yep. Means the ball was tipped. It would have been roughing the kicker had the ball not been tipped. Thing average. Weeks one and two, 41.1, and down to 35-9 with the substitute punters. First down from the 38-yard line for Denver and Joe Dudek through the middle to the 32-yard line. What do you make of that, Dan? Well, I, I think it's quite clearly very hard to do. You know, punting the football is one of those things that looks remarkably easy, but when you stand down on the field, you feel the heat of the rush. You punt out of your own end zone. You find out that there are... A lot of teams that don't do it very well. Hey, there are a lot of teams that with their regular punters have a 35-9 average. Mm -hmm. Second down and four. From the 32-yard line. And this is Nathan Poole, the one cent present Bronco. He played with the team a couple of years ago. Darrell Goodlow making the tackle. 
Is it my imagination or are the Denver Broncos making a concerted effort to run away from one Mr. Howie Long? A lot of work up the middle, a lot of work to the left. They're eh? not uh, over anxious to challenge Howie, although that was where the touchdown run came, but that was clear to the outside. Two down blocks sealing off the inside. A lot of the straight ahead stuff. Let's see if there's a game plan to stay away from Howie Long. First and 10 at the 28. Denver ahead 7 0, 7 17 to go in the period. And the pass is caught for a first down at the 15 yard line, and another marker goes down. And Watson sandwiched and shaken up. He's in agony. He took a tremendous shot right in the ribs. That ball thrown high. He had to go up for it, and Watson's the kind of player that will go up, total concentration, and he did. came down with the football, and he took a tremendous shot. The illegal procedure is the penalty. Let's watch Watson again. He's here on the line of scrimmage. That's Greg Hill that gives him a shot, shoves him back to the inside, and then Eddie Anderson, the safety, is the guy that comes up and puts the helmet right in Steve Watson's ribs. Oh, that's... You can't describe that, can you? If you're going to go out and really start it to... Uh, Hopefully it is just that, that he had the wind knocked out of him. We'd like to think that's it. Well, that's a good sign, him raising mm -hmm. up his right shoulder. You see, he brought it back down, but he did get it up and over the shoulders of one of the Bronco trainers. Takes his place. Swanson, number 80. First and 15. Dudek is the tailback. And going deep for Swanson, incomplete. Covered on the play and blanketed, and a flag goes down. A late flag, Greg Hill interfering. And Hill is complaining, but it did appear as though he bumped him when the ball was still in the air. I think the thing we want to look for is Hill's right arm. Number 36 defense, pass interference, first now, down. Now watch, watch Greg Hill. Now watch his right arm. Does it get up underneath Swanson right here? Yep, he touches him with the right arm. That has to be what the official called because there wasn't a lot of contact other than that. Howie Long in there pressuring Karcher, but Karcher trying to go deep to one of the slower receivers they have, trying to catch the Raiders off balance. They get the penalty and they have a first down and goal. First and goal, Denver at the eight yard line. Two deck. He scored the earlier touchdown. He makes it second and goal at the three. Ronnie Washington, the linebacker. Making the stop, Tom Flores. You saw Tom, the Raider coach, a man who has taken his team to two Super Bowls and two Super Bowl victories. And the Raiders, as we say, coming into tonight's game, and this the end of the fourth week of play in what is now a 15-game schedule. The Raiders and the Bears are the only unbeaten team. Chicago 4-0, Raiders 3-0. Second and goal. Dudek, another touchdown. And what a lead block that time by Nathan Poole. These are the two, Poole and Dudek, that Danny Reeves said would help him. So Dudek has scored twice. Clendenin has kicked two extra points. And with 5.59 to play in the first quarter, Denver leads the Raiders by two touchdowns. We wondered whether they would get here, but they are here. And the stadium typically with a Raider game is rocking. And it is a little unnerving because this press box does shake and I, I don't particularly care for it. Glendennon's kick is taken at the five yard line by Harkey who cut in front of Calhoun. And Lance Harkey, a rookie from Illinois, gets taken down at the 25 yard line. Meanwhile, Rob Harrison has separated his shoulder, one of the Raider running backs. So he is out, and they are looking on the uh, in the Denver locker room at the ribs of Steve Watson. And we'll keep you updated on that.
Meanwhile, it's Evans and the Raiders at their own 25-yard line, first and 10. Ellis and Horton are the running backs, and this is Craig Ellis with a lot of Canadian Football League experience. Out to the 29-yard line. He did uh, the brunt of the ball carrying last week for the Raiders in their win over Kansas City, and then during practice this week, uh, they were calling Horton's number a lot and have been calling Horton's number for the most part tonight. Ellis originally came up to San Francisco back in 1982, didn't make it there, and spent five years up in the Canadian Football League. Put together a 70-yard game last week against Kansas City. And we saw Ellis last year with the Miami Dolphins. Second down, rushes on, screen, but no blocking. And it's Ellis who makes the catch, and he would have been better off dropping the football. Jim Ryan, two yards. There's one of your veterans that, that can make a major difference. The screen is on. You had the perfect situation for the screen. You had the full blitz and had an opportunity to break for a big play because when you have the screen working against the blitz, you usually then break it off. But Ryan read it all the way, and he was there to make the difference. And a flag is down. Fred Silva, the referee. And the field judge also involved, that's Bob Lewis. Defense holding five yards, first down. We think it might have been Ray Woodard. Well, that's unfortunate for Denver. That negates a good play by Jim Ryan in smelling out the screen, staying locked up on Ellis, and then making the play for a loss. And a break for the Raiders. So the Raiders have the football at their own 35. 448 to play first quarter. 14 to nothing, Denver. Again, last week, LA routed Kansas City, and the Broncos were routed by Houston. Horton this time sets up as a wide receiver, top of your screen. And Evans looks that way and tries to hit him, but leads him too much. KC Clark with the coverage second down. And I know a lot of people are weak. normal starting quarterback of the Raiders, Mark Wilson, watching Vince Evans run this ball club. Second down and 10. And it's Ethan Horton fighting his way. And there's a flag down in the secondary. And there's also bumping and shoving going on. Two on a two. Areas. Yep. Further to what Dan said, these games are much like training camp games, and that is that you can pull together a defense much faster than you can an offense. So you're going to have your quarterback chase out of there many, many times. And when you have one like Vince Evans, he can turn something like that being chased out of the pocket into something on to a very positive side. You know, maybe it's not the players on these two teams that hate each other. Maybe it's just the uniforms. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> these guys haven't been around long enough to build up any animosity. And yet already we've had a couple skirmishes, yep. one ejection. <laughs> Let's take a look at this one. David Williams working against Casey Clark, who had the interception return. But inside, we've got more pushing, shoving, and let's have a little get together. Ron Wheeler, the backup tight end, also in there with Earl Johnson. And the orange and blue and the silver and black face to face. Nothing new there. Colors are definitely not coordinated, and they never have been. Huh. No, they clash. <laughs> Reeves upset over the call, which has given L.A. the ball in Bronco territory at the 49. Horton slithering, but tripped up. Jim Ryan got him by the ankles from behind. Loss of one, second down and 11. Jim Ryan in his ninth year as a Bronco out of William & Mary. Not big. He only goes about 218 pounds, but he sure makes a lot of things happen on a football field and has for years. Uh, many people thought he might not be around. Danny Reeves thinking in terms of bigger people that he felt he needed going into this year after what happened in the Super Bowl. But Ryan is here, and he has made a difference already this evening. And where Dan Reeves needs him tonight, you saw Jim Ryan looking to the sideline. He's taking the calls from the sideline, running the defensive huddle, and making all the calls up front. What a plus to have a veteran doing that. Second and 11. 
And it's complete to Carl Aikens, number 83, and a first down at the 37-yard line. Aikens from Northern Illinois. And he was in the Raiders camp and also spent some time in the Cowboys camp. He, he in fact, has been in six different camps. He has been around. He finally has found a home. And again, you saw what Vince Evans has never been questioned about. He has a powerful arm. When you throw an out like he threw a moment ago, you know you have nothing but brute strength. He had that right on the string and right on target. 3-12 to go in the period. Raucous crowd. 38-yard line. Horton. And that play didn't work two plays ago and doesn't work now. Bryant Wynn making the tackle. We were talking about F72 yards in the game 27 years ago, and that was the most by a Raider QB into 11th last week. He's still in that Raider record book in several places. Second and 10 from the 37. Evans tackled at the 39-yard line <laughs> by an effusive Jeff Tupper. He's out of Oklahoma. He learned that move from Bosworth. Yeah, it's tough to catch a pass when you're over getting some Gatorade on the seat of your pants and your own bench. <laughs> Making the most of the chuck. Shotgun on third and 12. Broncos rushed four. Evans protected well, and the pass overthrown, but a flag. Horton, the intended receiver. And Fred Silva getting the word from the side judge, Merrill Douglas. Against the Broncos. Well, that turns a third and a dozen. Number 40, illegal use. And these cornerbacks have been beating up on these Raiders wide receivers. You saw Casey Clark a moment ago against Dave Williams. And there was a... I guess he had him early going out. That's what they called it. That they called it against Martin Rudolph against Aikens. So you, you're allowed contact, but you're not allowed that lingering contact. And after five yards. First and 10, 43-yard line, Ellis... Stepped up. He's having trouble hearing Evans, or he's forgotten the play. Or the snap count, and the Raiders opt for a timeout to avoid a, another penalty. 153 to play in the first period. Broncos leading 14 0, but the Raiders on the move. At the 153 mark, 153 to go in the first quarter. First and 10, LA at the 34 yard line. Vince Evans gives the ball to Ellis. He goes through the middle for a gain of three, down to about the 31. Ryan and Wynn make the tackle before this big and very noisy crowd. And where the player's not on strike, you would never know it from the enthusiasm in here. We'll get an official count later, but the stadium seats in the high 70s, and we were just talking about it during that commercial break, but there has to be somewhere in the low to mid 60s in this ballpark. And if I'm a striking ball player, Frank, I'd, I'd be a little demoralized to see a crowd this big. And if you're on the management council, you'd be encouraged. I guess you could two sides of that coin. In all reality, there have been many seats. We don't know exactly how many that were given out to public schools in the area. Second down and seven. Evans has it tipped and incomplete. Mario Perry almost came up with it after the deflection. It'll be third down and seven. Lucas was the man who tipped it, Tim Lucas. the Raiders are going to try to utilize of Vince Evans and again Jim Ryan is just all over this football field making play after play if I said that Howie Long was the dominant defensive player on this field well he probably is on paper but in the first quarter that that award that mantle right now being worn by Jim Ryan he's directing traffic out there too Dan he's telling defensive backs where to be he's running the whole show defensively third and seven Evans, the mobile one, has the first down, takes it to the 20-yard line. Vince Evans improvising and picking up the first and keeping the drive going at the 20. Next to dimension we talked about on a broken play, he'll get you some yardage. And again, defense always ahead of the offense when you begin with a new ball club. And that's basically what happened a couple of weeks ago when these teams came together. 
You can put together a defense much more quickly than you can an offense, and a quarterback like Vince Evans can exploit a defense much better than one who cannot move around. First and 10 at the 20-yard line, 21-yard line for the Raiders. Horton for a gain of four. Let's update again. If you joined us late, Gene Upshaw, about a half hour before we came on the air tonight, says he is going to submit a proposal to the owners, submit it for mediation arbitration, and then any unresolved issues would go to binding arbitration. Jack Donlin will have no comment until he officially sees the proposal, but John Jones, a management council spokesman, says that historically the owners have not gone for arbitration. In any event, before the night is done, we'll talk to Tex Schramm. We'll also be talking to Pat Boland, the owner of the Denver Broncos. We'll go to the second period at Denver. The Broncos lead 14. To the Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado. The LA Raiders trailing 14-0. Have it. Second down, call it seven from the 18-yard line as Horton gets inside the 15, the 10, and takes it to the four. Ethan Horton for a first and goal. And as we begin the second quarter, this ABC Sports exclusive is being brought to you by Kellogg's Raisin Brand with two scoops of plump, juicy raisins in every package. The Raiders settling down somewhat now. Over the right side, Bruce Wilkerson, their number two draft pick this year is a left guard. You have Steve Wright who has been all around the league and has played a lot of football with these Raiders and they're very strong over that right side. You saw it right there. That time it was Wright with a block. Put Bryant Wynn down on the ground. There they are. 66 is Wright. 68 is Wilkerson. They're huge. First and goal from the three. Play fake. Evan sidearms it for the touchdown. Good move. Mario Perry dropped down, did Evans, and slung it in there. Evans, a constant threat. Uh, he pulled the ball down. It looked like he was going to run. You have to think run. If you're a defensive back, you slide off your man you're covering, and that's what happened. Mario Perry was wide open, but a, another fine athletic move on the part of Vince Evans. He just snapped that with his wrist. Here you'll see him get the pressure, play action to the left. Is, Intended receiver not there. A little quick look like it's going to run. And Mario Perry uncovers in the end zone and a good flick by Evans. So the Raiders keeping the drive alive on some penalties and so propitious third down plays are able to cash in. The extra point is good. And the Raiders have the lead. Denver on top, 14 to 7. Denver on top by a score of 14 to 7. Mario Perry out of the University of Mississippi. Another one of those Raiders, though, that was in camp. He was waived during training camp this summer. So he knows the numbers, knows the terminology. It makes it a lot easier. David Hardy, who kicked the extra point. Get the ball back, you guys. To boot it. Funny. Most of the replacement kickers look just like the regular kickers, don't they? 5'7", <laughs> 160. Where do you find all these barefoot guys? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most of them carrying green cards. Swanson at the goal line. And back out to the seven yard line, LaRon Brown. LaRon Brown taking it back to the seven. Let's go back and look at Mario Perry, Mario Perry's touchdown. Motion is really confusing to young defensive back. Watch Perry come in motion, come back, then go up and all the way across. Now, if you're a young defensive back just trying to learn a system, the motion man confuses you. Perry starts to the outside, back to the inside. Now, look how everyone takes the play fake, and Perry all alone in the back of the end zone. Now, excellent by Evans to get him the football, but clearly a blow by the Bronco and there's Broncos in their secondary first and ten 
Denver starting deep in its own six. Karcher going deep, and it's underthrown and tipped and incomplete. Massey had to hold up and couldn't hold on. Not much to differentiate there. The Raiders had a hard time getting their offense on track. Broncos occupying most of the time of possession, but they seem to have it now pretty well stabilized. They're running right, and they're running well behind their two big offensive linemen over the right side, Wright and Wilkerson. Those were Carter's numbers last week in a game they lost by 30 points. Second and 10. Draw. Nathan Poole. And stopped out at the nine-yard line. Hit first by number 98, Daryl Goodlow. Right now, what's working against Denver is the poor execution on their kickoff return, making them operate from the shadows of their own end zone. That's a tough way. The Raiders got some momentum by scoring a touchdown, and now to just go three downs and out, kick it back, and... Let, uh, let the Raiders, rather, start inside your own 50. Not exactly what the Broncos would like to do. Carter, that one completion was to Steve Watson, who's out of the game. On third and six, Carter keeps, and he's close to a first, and a flag goes down after the play. That's a design quarterback draw all the way. Umpire making this call, Dave Hamilton. Offense, number 64, holding huh. half the distance to the goal line. The veteran, Billy Bryan. A designed play all the way, though, on the quarterback draw, and it was well executed. The Raider defensive lineman got into their pass lane. Someone got moved a yard, and Karcher had an opening, but Billy Bryan's mistake brings it back, and he even has to be tougher for a veteran ball player to get a flag in a situation like that. Third down and nine now. Denver at its own seven-yard line. Broncos ahead 14-7 early in the second quarter. Shotgun. Parker. Rush on. Going deep again. Underthrows it again and incomplete and saving the interception that time on a pass intended for LaRon Brown. It was Brown more than anything else playing defensive back at the end of the play with Rod Hill. Keith Browner forced Karcher to deliver this much more quickly than he wanted to. And it is underthrown, and actually, it's Hill that reacts first to the football, and he has it in his hands, but LaRon Brown is out there. And a smart move puts the tackle on Brown and pulls him away from the football. Ralph Giacomaro from Penn State to do the kicking, and back at the 50-yard line is Rick Calhoun, who went to Cal State Fullerton. That's a good kick. 46 yard line, Calhoun. And a good run back. Gets some nice blocking. He's inside the 20 and all the way for the score. And no flags. He did so much of that on his own. He got maybe one block, but there was no picket line. It was just Rick Calhoun. He got on his one. Own. Frank, he got one block coming back. We're going to see it. Watch the right side of your screen as he breaks up field. One Denver Bronco right there, and that is Ron Foster. And he just to... puts the head down, turns on the speed, and the rookie uh, top draft pick, and well, a ninth round draft pick of Detroit this year, takes it in. He is really thrilled. 46 yard punt and a 55 yard run back. And Los Angeles can tie the game. David Hardy, and that's Mark Wilson who holds. And it's good. First time Calhoun has ever returned to punt. Rookie from Cal State Fullerton. Let's look at this again from the end zone. It's Calhoun on his own, but there's the block by Foster. Good break back to the inside of the field, and momentum hasn't changed much here, has it? Tie ball game. I've led 14 nothing, but the Raiders have come back to score twice and now Hardy to kick off with Joe Dudek and Shane Swanson back to receive for the Broncos. And 
Watson's direction at the one. 20. And out of bounds at the 35 yard line. So a first and 10 for the Broncos there. All right, let's get an immediate reaction, an initial reaction. We have Tex Schramm, president of the Cowboys, on the management council. We'll have a chance to elaborate later, but Tex, as we visit with you in your Dallas home, what is your initial response to what Upshaw has proposed tonight? Dudek has just run for a first down to the 44. Your management council spokesman has said historically the owners have not been in favor of arbitration. No. For that. Well, we're not in favor of putting the future of the National Football League in the hands of an of arbitration of, of a single arbiter. So uh, that would be one of the you know we'd have to study. That would be one of the positions we'd have to study. Dudek, meanwhile, takes it to the 45 for a gain of one second to nine. Tex, we understand that uh, there was also a letter delivered to you uh, from the Players Association and from Gene Upshaw. Uh, have you had an opportunity to look at that letter and read that letter? Oh, yes, I read that letter. I Obviously, I assume as a form letter sent. Can I get this? Basically, are there any other plans for the management council to uh, get together in the immediate future? The proposal is turned down. The players are out for the season. Were you aware of that? No, we're playing football, so we'll make a decision on what we feel is best for the. All right, Tex, we will visit with you again at the half. Thank you for the moment. Now, we might also point out that we invited Gene Upshaw to be with us tonight, and he took the position that he would not come on and appear in a replacement game. On third down and nine, Bill Pakel got in there to bust up that play. And so it's fourth down now, and the Raiders have very much picked up the momentum in this one. If Gene Upshaw did make that statement that if this proposal is rejected, the players out for are out for the season, Gene has put himself and the players who are walking the picket lines in a very dangerous position. Uh, it is tough to make a statement like that and back it up. And uh, I don't know that the players right now, gentlemen, are in a position to play hardball. Particularly when you recall the players who said only a week ago, if it was not settled this week, that they would be coming in this week. Well, at halftime, obviously, we'll deal with this as Giacomaro kicks to Calhoun from the nine. And Calhoun, who ran the last one back for a touchdown, comes up a little bit short this time. It's still a, a decent run back out. You can't ask him, huh? Nobody. Ten twenty-nine to go in the half. Game tied, 14-14. Well, if you can believe the Broncos, this will be a holding call against the Raiders. Possession foul on the receiving team, number 35, holding. It'll be first down. Eddie Anderson for the hold. And so the Raiders start deep in their own territory. Well, this Saturday at 8 Eastern time, we know where we'll be. The Metrodome in Minneapolis, the Minnesota Twins. And our congratulations to the Twins for a remarkable season. And Tom Kelly, the rookie manager, leading the Twins against either the Giants or the Cardinals, and they'll play game six tomorrow. The World Series exclusively on ABC, beginning Saturday night at 8 Eastern from Minneapolis. And you'll be there. Tim McCarver, Jim Palmer, 
Amazing, just an amazing story in Minnesota. Dan, your hometown, it's got to be on fire tonight. Well, they are. Uh, Cardinals put in a position now of having to win two, but both of them will be at Bush Stadium. Both down. And by the way, if you did somehow miss it today, Minnesota beat Detroit. The final was nine to five, and so the Twins knock off the Tigers four games to one. Of course, many people giving the Cardinals no chance of winning both games at home, but I have a feeling. Trebecki and Tudor tomorrow. Meanwhile, Raiders Broncos here tonight. First and ten. Evans, the quarterback for L.A. at the five-yard line before this foot-stopping crowd. Ethan Horton slipped as he got started, and that, in effect, ended that play, second and ten. One thing you can be fairly sure here in Mile High Stadium, you seldom hear your snap numbers if you're the opposition, and you're down in the closed part of the end zone. It gets noisy, it gets loud. Occasionally, you, late in the year, you might catch a snowball or two down there. We've seen that happen. <laughs> it, we... Ask, ask Ray Wershing about snowballs or two, huh? That's not an assistant coach flashing signals in. <laughs> Second down and ten at the five-yard line. Evans avoiding the safety and then throwing incomplete. And paying the third and ten from the five. 9.43 to go in the half. Tied at 14. Keep it on the ground. Horton. Nice move to turn a, a one-yard gain into a gain of about six, but they're still going to have to kick. Bryant Wynn made the stop. And that play was made possible by Earl Johnson. Strong safety came up and fought off a blocker, and when Horton broke to the outside, was there. Hey, Swanson, a former cowboy that rode in rodeo in the national championships. Yeah. A real cowboy. Oh. <laughs> These players have come from strange places. Good kick this time. Fielded at the 47 yard line. He doesn't get the block he needs, and down he goes. On a tackle by Hill, and down goes another penalty marker. A lot of flags, especially on special teams, play tonight. And that's not surprising. Look how many we see during the regular season. And uh, the biggest difference in football of a month ago in football of it today is is in the kicking game. It's no secret that special teams is where we'll see the most mistakes made and another illustration right here. 58 illegal block above the waist. Illegal man 25 downfield replay. <laughs> Jim Ellis number 58. A lot of penalties and you will because a lot of these players the last time they play they could hit below the waist. That is no longer the case. Yeah. Yeah, sort of lost in the shuffle. So many things to talk about this year with some of the the subtle rule changes. Remember all the the, the big deal that was made of the one step, two step quarterback situation this year. You, nobody's really talking about it. No, because it uh, let's be realistic in the in the order of what's important and what's not, that's pretty well down the list. <laughs> you know, getting back to the kicking game for a moment. You know, you almost have to be superhuman to play on the special teams anyway and do your job without drawing some sort of a penalty. The structure of rules in the kicking game in the National Football League has really gotten to the point where uh, it's almost a 50-50 proposition. The Bosch again to kick. His last kick went to the Denver 47, and this one appears to be tipped again. And he gets a very fortuitous bounce. Darrell Russell, who tipped the last punt, was the guy who came flying in and may have gotten a piece of that one. Still, it bounces all the way down to the 37-yard line. What kind of a bounce? A fortuitous bounce. Oh, and a good one, too. <laughs> <laughs> I had a time with Green Bay Week 2. First and 10 from the 37. In a moment, we're going to hook up with Don Shula in Miami, and hopefully he is indoors on this stormy night in South Florida. From the 37-yard line, little screen to Dudek, and he takes it out to the 37 fumble, and it's recovered by L.A. Bill Pakel, one of the vets who crossed the line, number 71, picks up the football. 
Couple of fumbles now for the Broncos. Take a look at it again. Hopping back. Archer wanted to go downfield and he dumps it off out and going out into the flat to Dudek. Ball just pulled out of his arm and Pickell who has been all over the football field covers it. And that's Dudek's second fumble of the night and started off strong with some bruising running but he's made a couple of mistakes that have cost the Denver Broncos some field position. Let's see if the Raiders who scored 14 in a row can add some more. First and 10, L.A. from the 38-yard line. This is Ellis. And he gets to the 37-yard line. He's able to turn it into a minimal gain as Tim Lucas makes the tackle. Craig Ellis, who played with the Dolphins last year. We have Don Shula in Miami. Now, Don, we've talked to Tech Schramm, and I know you're not directly involved, but can we get a response from you as to what Upshaw has said tonight and whether there's any cause for optimism this thing will be over? Optimistic. I really. Don, we can't ask you about the football you're watching here tonight. You had some fine football played yesterday in Miami, but as you look at what we're seeing tonight, what's your impression? It is third down and 14. Don, as a coach, what will you be able to do if there are replacement games next week? What, what can you do in the third week now that you've had the guys together for a while you weren't able to do in the first two? Meanwhile, here, 7.19 to go. Don, we thank you very much. Don Shula, the coach of the Dolphins, who yesterday routed Kansas City. 42 nothing, and timeout is now called. It'll, it'll be fourth down and four, and the Raiders uh, have to think about whether they want to go for it or whether they want to attempt a 49-yard field goal. And meanwhile, as long as we have this timeout, Don, are you still there? Right. Okay, Dan, go ahead. Uh, Don, the one thing I think that is apparent this weekend, and if it continues much longer, is where we are seeing a big improvement is offensively, that it is easier to play defensive football, easier to put it in, but week in and week out as it continues to extend, I think we're starting to see crisper play offensively. Well, that's what you have to do with your offense because the defenses are giving you so many different looks that it takes you a while to, uh, to get to know your blocking assignments, your blitz pickups. And when you get that, then your quarterback has more time to throw the football. You can make the adjustments in the running game to try to get some things going that way. So I was very, very pleased with the way that our football team played uh, yesterday as far as uh, picking up blitzes and getting the running game going and making some things happen. Don, as your coaching staff prepares a game plan, you've got the Jets this coming Sunday. Are you doing two game plans, one for the team you have now and one if in case uh, your veterans happen to come in sometime during the week? Each and every week we've had to do that. You prepare two game plans, and uh, uh, this week <laughs> the, the Jets have four veteran defensive linemen in camp, and they're, and they're doing a lot of things defensively that they've done in the past under Bud Carson. So we, it's not going to be that big a difference, but uh, the, the condition of the veteran football players, if and when they report, that's going to be a concern of ours. You don't know how many have been working out and for how long. All right, thank you again, Don, as we return to action here on fourth down and four. Raiders at the 32-yard line and going for it in this tie game halfway through the second quarter. Deep drop and then over the middle, and it's tipped, and it's incomplete. And so Denver will take over on down. <laughs> and, and who do you for Wheeler, and that's Jim Ryan. Who do you think would tip the pass? And they'll tell you a couple of things uh, about how much confidence they have in their place kicker and the confidence that they do have in their defense. 
Jim Ryan, another big play defensively, his second deflected pass. This guy has been all over the field and on a fourth down in your own territory. Nice play, Jim. So the Denver Broncos now at their own 32-yard line, 7.06 to go, first half. Tied at 14 with Ken Karcher from Tulane, the quarterback. Play action, and he winds up hitting the H-back, Michaud, and he's out to the 43-yard line. Bobby Michaud, number 46, one of the real Broncos out of Texas. Caught nine passes last week. And as you can see, all short yardage passes. When you catch nine, good for 69. You're catching a lot underneath. That was pretty much all that Danny Reeves could do a week ago against Houston. He admitted he was not terribly prepared for it, but he has two good backs in there now, Dudak and Poole, at least experienced backs. He can do many more things tonight than he could a week ago. First and 10 from the 43-yard line, and Dudek gets pummeled at the 45, and it's Howie Long, who's been pretty silent, who we have isolated. How about if we check in on Howie Long, who's been laboring in his first game, working against Keith Kartz. Kartz, if you'll notice, is moving long backward off the line of scrimmage. Howie is a good three, three and a half yards off the line before he comes off the block and makes the uh, tackle on Dudek. Keith Kartz, number 72 at right tackle, is giving Howie Long a, a handful of trouble tonight. Second down eight for the 45-yard line. Too high. Intended for Swanson. It'll be third down and eight. But you notice on almost every pass play, the Broncos are going to have two people on Howie Long. They did that time. They had Kartz and they had Hood both working on Howie Long. They weren't even deceptive about it. They just both went for him, and he's the man that is going to draw their attention Two men all night long. Let's take a look at the top of your screen. You'll see two of them. Hood now stepping out to back up the block of Karts. And actually, Hood never even had to put a block on Howie Long. Keith Karts did a nice job all by himself. Third and eight from the shotgun. And off the fingertips of Leron Brown, number 82. So the Broncos, who have been stymied now they have bogged down after an impressive opening drive you wonder how much this Bronco offensive line has been buoyed by the return of a couple of veterans and Bill Bryan and Dave Stutter they're playing a lot more aggressively than they played last week in that loss to Houston by the score of 40 to 10 where they were just run off the field and tonight they're playing pretty doggone well double teaming for Kellen Long almost every play but being effective at it Calhoun, who ran one back all the way, 55 yards. Giacomaro's kick. And that one winds up hitting a Bronco on the way down. It bounced off number 21. That's Earl Johnson. So it's dead at the spot. At the 21-yard line. Mile High Stadium. This crowd raucous, and they've been somewhat stilled by... The Broncos, who've been unable to get it going offensively here in the second quarter, but again, to, to put this one in perspective in terms of the standings, the Raiders are unbeaten. And if they win tonight, they would lead Denver by two and a half. They'd be 4-0. San Diego is 3-1, and one, and Denver would be in trouble in the AFC West. And also going against the Raider team that coming into tonight's ballgame was at least a 10, and in, in many places, more than a 10-point favorite to win. First and 10, L.A. from the 21-yard line and through the middle and going nowhere and carrying the ball. I believe it's Jim Brown. No, no, not that Jim Brown. This is Jim Brown, B-R-O-W-N-E, out of Boston College. There he is. Teammate of Doug Flutie's on that Cotton Bowl team of yeah. Boston Colleges. Well, what was it? The, the real Jim Brown <laughs> was going to make a comeback a couple of years ago, remember? <laughs> Maybe now's the time. This might be the perfect opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Well, wait till we see number 16 in a Giants <laughs> uniform in two weeks. <laughs> Pull down those leather flaps and let it fly. <laughs> if he comes back, that'll really be the dirty dozen. <laughs> <laughs> Second and 10. <laughs> Evan sewing, and there's Jim Brown again <laughs> to the 26-yard line. Stopped by clear, Tim Lucas. Clear that up a little, uh, big man, on my right. <laughs> oh, he starred in the movie The Dirty Dozen. Don't you remember that? Great scene, dropping the hand grenades on the way up. <laughs> 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 I thought you were talking about that Periscope or Darby's Rangers or some of those 
old flicks. <laughs> Tom Flores, the, the quiet one, and the, the affable one, and the accommodating one, and the successful coach of the LA Raiders. Third down and six from the 26. Caught, and I think shy of the first, Greg Lathan, he needs to get to the 31-yard line. Earl Johnson and Steve Fitzhugh Converge on the tackle, and it depends on the spot. Well, it always depends on the spot, but you know what I mean. <laughs> well, I don't think they got the spot they got last time because they're going to have to punt it away. There wasn't even a second thought on the part of Flores, who went deep in Denver territory on fourth and about three. The punting unit comes right out immediately on fourth and about one. Vince Gamash, that first punt was tipped, and the second one was a beauty. Well, actually, it was a beauty because it got a good roll. Swanson is back at his own 26. And this is a real live NFL kick taken at the 19-yard line. And back out to the 31-yard line comes Swanson. And it's 342 now to go as the Broncos take over in the first half. Swanson out of Nebraska, I mentioned earlier, a whole lot more physically demanding than playing football. I don't know that there's anything in football that compares with getting on the back of a Brahma bull. From the 31-yard line, Dudek runs right up the middle for a gain of about four. Second and six. I point out, if you got around when this is all over, he's just here for the moment, as so many of these players are. Second down, call at five at the 35-yard line, and it's Dudek again for a first down. Hey, that's running for first down, too. Up front, watch Winford Hood, number 78, come on the trap. He turns upfield, blocks Rick Ackerman to the inside. If Ackerman would have come upfield, that'd have been a trap kicking him to the outside when Ackerman hung on the line of scrimmage. A very good read by Hood, rather than try the kick out, Pinned him back to the inside, and it's a Denver first down. Broncos at their own 43. That much time left first half. 14-14 the score. And wide open is Michel, and he oh. drops the football. He was out in front. He might not have scored the touchdown because he had a hold up, and Rod Hill had the angle, but certainly he'd have been deep into L.A. territory. But he was thick and end zone before he made the catch. And a good read by Karcher. The blitz is on. He knows that Michel is going to be open. Michel is there. Uh, Micho will be thinking about that all night long. He had nine receptions, as Al mentioned a moment ago, a week ago. This one, well, if he had not been able to get it in the end zone, he was certainly being awfully close to it. Oh, you think about that for a long time. Second and ten at the 43. Nathan Poole is in there, number 34, and they leave him in the block. And Karcher has to scramble and get sacked at the 34-yard line by Rick Ackerman. Keith Browner was also in on the play, and if Browner's familiar to you, sure, it's his second week in a row on Monday Night Football, number 51 Browner. Last week, he was a 49er in New York, and he got traded during the week, so he's just following us around. In passing situations, the Raiders plan to use him as a down lineman. He's that versatile kind of player that can either get down or stand up. Third down and 18. As we come upon the two-minute warning. And Karcher going very deep and incomplete. Massey and a flag. A flag is down to the 20-yard line. And we've got and another one in the backfield. And I think that's going to be holding on Karts. I think he dragged Howie Long to the ground. And it is. It's Massey and Hill who were fighting for the football as the penalty was also thrown in the secondary. Offense number 72, holding, decline, fourth down. That's the other weapon that he has, Howie Long, doesn't he, Dan? Yes, and here's Keith Carts. Watch him. Howie Long's going to make a move to the inside. Now watch Carts. As an offensive lineman, you so often you figure, well, I've got to hold it. Well, he's going to wipe out my quarterback. He's in good position right there, but he crosses his legs over and then uses his right arm to go across the back of Long and drag him to the ground. 
Two minute warning comes with 156 to play in the half. Which Ohio Stadium in Denver and the Broncos have the football fourth down and will have to punt. Ralph Giacomaro to do the punting. And that's Rick Calhoun back to receive and Calhoun takes it at his own 19 yard line. And he brings it back out to the 30 and there is a flag down. There's a true flag. There's also a yellow. There's a yellow flag which is the real one and an orange object at the 20 which they left on the field which looked like the flag which was not on the prior play. There it is. Real one on the left. That's an airplane. Replacement one on the right. Block above the waist in the back. Half the distance. First down. <laughs> Let's see if we can see the clip. Well there it is on the right <laughs> side. Not hard I'll to see. Screen. Pretty visible. Tough to hide that one. The Broncos tonight distributed some orange cards for yeah. the crowd to wave around in that thing on the field down there yeah. as an airplane. <laughs> it's so a, this have to point out there is yeah. no 49 on the roster. We'd like to tell you who did that. But he is not listed. At the half, we'll talk again with Tex Schramm of the, the president of the Cowboys and on the management council, Pat Bowen of the Denver Broncos, who is regarded as one of the real doves amongst the owners. Very outspoken this past week, as he usually is. From the nine yard line, Raiders on first and ten. And through the middle goes Craig Ellis. 49 is a fellow by the name of Victor Jackson, who was added just about an hour before tonight's ball game by the Raiders. And that's why he doesn't appear anywhere on our rosters. Victor Jackson. Came from Colorado Springs just down the road here. Just <laughs> happened to be thumbing his way through. We're a little short, so. I, I wish he'd turn around so we could see if he has his name on the back of his chair. Thank you, Victor. There it is. There it is. Oh, there he is. Eight. Actually, he played in the USFL. He played with the Washington Federals and the Orlando Renegades. Well, the Monday night research machine is in the high I'm telling you. Plug that computer in, baby. And let's see, he likes uh, game one of the World Series. Second down and nine from the 11 yard line. And it's Jim Brown taking it out to the 13 and Tupper makes the tackle. And a timeout is taken here. With 133. And it's the Broncos taking the timeout on defense. No secret, they want to force the Raiders to punt. Everything's so disrupted, and he is very down when you talk to him. Third and seven now. Ellis, and he fights out to the 20-yard line and should have a first down. And does. And so they'll be able to keep the ball for the balance of the half, should they choose to run out the clock from the 20. And a flag still third down and it goes against the Raiders to a holding call against L.A. negates the first down. No wonder they had such a big hold to the right side. So instead of a first and ten it is third down and twelve. From the seven. Ellis. And now Denver should take a timeout here at the 10 yard line. Jim Ryan makes the tackle. And Denver will spend its final timeout to preserve as much of the clock as they can. With 1.15, they'll get the ball back. Amazing in this game. Big rush. Nearly tipped again, fielded at the 47 yard line and run back to the 41 by Swanson. Excitement on every punt. Meanwhile, Denver has it at the 41 yard line. No timeouts left for the Broncos. And a, of course, we'll have a hurry up off this. Now, this is something they could not have worked on at any great length. And it's going to be interesting to see how they pull it off. From the 41. 
Over the middle to Dudek, and he takes it down to the 22-yard line, and the clock will keep running because they don't have a timeout. 55-54 and going down. This play, of course, has already been called. Karcher from the shotgun will remind them of the call. He's already given them the snap number. From the 23, it is incomplete and bounces off the back of Rod Hill. He wasn't looking. Had he turned around, he might have had an interception. <laughs> All right, Rod, put that arm up in the air. Former number one <laughs> draft pick of the Dallas Cowboys, and here he is, Rod Hill. Never really made it big down there with the Dallas Cowboys. Traded off to Buffalo and Detroit. He was so intense on the receiver. And Lauren Brown, and he took it right off the bat. Second and ten at the 23. Micho in motion. Parker coming back this way, complete, but staying in bounds. That's a key tackle. Rick Massey made the catch, but on the tackle, Greg Hill kept him in bounds. Very important. Clock keeps running. From the 13, it's not a first down. It's third down and one. And then he grounds the ball to stop the clock. And a flag goes down. And it wasn't a first down either. It was third down, but he was looking to stop the clock. You know, over, the, over on the left side, Howie Long is saying that Keith Carts had moved out of his stance. You know, Michaud lined up as a true tight end that time. I wonder if that has something to do with being in a poor formation. Let's. I think there's more than one penalty, though. Again, this hurry-up offense, a two-minute drill, whatever you want to call it, is not something you perfect overnight, and they could not have worked on it very much. Defense, offside, illegal pass by the quarterback, threw the ball, hit an offensive player on the leg, it's mm. offset, replay. Huh. But it stops the clock. Top of your screen should be Howie Long. Moving quickly, he was not drawn off. There it is. Yeah. Trying to get to the outside. Now the illegal pass. Tell you what, this is a big break for, for Denver because it got them to stop the clock. He's trying to ground the football, which is legal, throwing it into the ground to stop the clock, but you can't hit one of your own players on the lower leg. That is a penalty. Parker into the end zone. Incomplete. Tipped by Hill intended for Massey. 14 seconds to go in the half. And Hill goes and talks to the Denver crowd. I don't know what kind of reception he's looking for. Conversing with the end zone crowd in Mile High Stadium. Key play here, you almost have to go into the end zone, look for the incompletion, because if you get a completion inbounds, you can't stop the clock. It's going to be very difficult to get a field goal unit on and get the field goal off. It's also third down. It's third down and one at the 13-yard line. That's Misho moving. Parker for Misho, incomplete. No flag. Fourth down. Archer, I'm sure, was only going to throw that ball in there close, even try to make the completion if he had a man wide open, knowing that the incompletion would stop the clock and he could get the field goal unit on. Misho was fairly well covered, and Carter literally threw it away. Mike Clendenin, who went to school at the University of Houston, and last week against the Oilers, kicked a 28-yard field goal. It is a 31-yard attempt. Dean May, the backup quarterback, will spot the ball at the 21-yard line. David Jones does the snapping. And the kick is straight and true. Five seconds to go in the half, and the Broncos have the lead again. They led 7-0, 14-0. Then the Raiders scored twice to tie, and now the Broncos lead by three. You know, no matter what you think of this kind of football, it's a real credit to some of the assistant coaches in the NFL. We talk about Danny Reeves, we talk about Tom Flores, but the guys who do the work and the guys that are staying up all night, and we heard Don Shula say a moment ago, they're really preparing two game plans. Should the veterans come back, and should they not come back? But it is a tremendous workload that they have been shouldering, and when you see something a moment ago, as we did, with a very fairly sophisticated two-minute offense, you know that a lot of assistant coaches have been doing 
an extraordinary amount of work, and they've been doing it well. You really have to wonder if the work we saw by Karcher and the Denver offensive team right there was a style of play and a quality of play that we would have seen a week ago. Something has to tell me that just another week of practice, uh, another four or five practices, another 15 hours on the practice field, that's the difference. Start to work on the subtleties, the sophisticated part of the game. Glenn Denon kicks a ground ball to try to avoid the long run back. And it's run back to the 32 by one of the upman, Ron Foster. So that's the end of the first half before a big and very enthusiastic crowd in Denver. 17-14 Broncos. And we'll update the strike situation. Start the third quarter. Fielded after some confusion by Calhoun at the six. Takes a bump. And then gets buried out at the 22-yard line. And from there will the Raiders begin this drive. And this ABC Sports exclusive is brought to you by Energizer. It do run run by the two automobile divisions of American Honda who invite you to see the new exciting lines of Honda and Acura automobiles today. And by Kellogg's brand flakes cereal. Vince Evans, longtime Bear quarterback. Leading the Raiders tonight and throws complete. His first effort of the third quarter takes him out to the 36-yard line. Carl Akins, number 83. First down. A loop on the inside. Steve Bryan looping around Jeff Tupper comes in and gets the hit on Evans. Jeff Tupper, who playing nose tackle tonight for Denver just got back in town this afternoon after his wife had a little baby little baby boy just yesterday was it not mm -hmm. flew home saw his new son got back here this afternoon big baby boy <laughs> first and ten and through the middle for a gain of just a couple of yards Ethan Horton number 23 Ethan followed Kelvin Bryant at North Carolina Meanwhile, illegal motion, decline. Decline? <laughs> yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yes. Okay. <laughs> Little on field dialogue. Their minds may not be totally on what they're discussing at the moment. Second down and nine at the 37 yard line. Ethan Horton now sets up as a wide out, bottom of the screen. And Evans going deep and has it knocked down, intended for Akins, who'd gotten behind Martin Rudolph, who just did get a hand on it. Evans just a little short of that, and let's take a look at Akins in the duel with the cornerback, Rudolph. Now, uh, Vince just takes a little bit off of it, and Rudolph was able to get a hand in there and deflect it. Uh, Akins definitely had his man beaten. And Rudolph was flirting with getting that left hand in there early. He had his left hand on Akins' shoulder pad. He came very close to drawing a call there. Third and nine, Los Angeles from the 37-yard line. The mobile one again, seeking the first down, and gets it out to the 49-yard line. Evans again, he knows where he is on the football field. He was a running quarterback when he was at USC, did the same thing in Chicago, did it with the Denver Gold, and he knew he had to get the 10 yards, and as soon as he had it down, he went. But very athletic. He had to be athletic on that play. The Raider offensive line is having trouble picking up Denver's stunning. Tupper was free that time and flushed Evans out, and that's what we talked about. That's why Evans is playing instead of Wilson, that mobility. First and ten, Raiders from the 49-yard line. Ethan Horton swinging wide and going nowhere and dragged down by Tim Lucas, who's having a pretty good night, number 58. 
Mm. Meanwhile, the report from the Broncos is that Steve Watson has six fractured ribs and he's in the hospital. He went with us earlier. He took a tremendous shot on a reception he made over the middle. We knew and that he was injured. We were hoping that maybe he had just had the wind knocked from him, such is not the case. Second down. Well. Evans throws and there's Ryan making the interception at the 34 yard line. He's everywhere. And there's a very good reason why Jim Ryan made that interception. The intended receiver on the first and 10 from the 35 yard line. Carter, the quarterback, Nathan Poole. And Poole to the Raider 49 yard line. First down. Nathan Poole played with the Broncos in the early 80s. Uh, has a lot of experience. Well, this is a dramatically improved Denver team over last week. First down, Denver at the 50 yard line. Ken Carter is the quarterback. Take to do that. To Micho complete and another first down taken out of bounds at the 32 yard line by number 91 Ronnie Washington. Washington trying to cover from a linebacker spot Micho out of the backfield and Micho as we've said earlier is is a good receiver out of the backfield nine receptions a week ago drop one tonight that could have given him a touchdown but he gets the first down on that one. First and 10 at the 33 yard line. Broncos lead by three. Fumble by Dudek. And it bounces right back into his hands at the 25 yard line. Dudek having trouble holding on to the football tonight. I think he lost it there just transferring arms. Let's see if he gets hit. He's got the ball right now in his right. Well I think maybe someone's elbow just got in there. Ronnie Washington a linebacker but. Nothing more than a glancing blow. Looked like Dudek was getting ready to transfer the ball over to his left, breaking into the open, and again it comes out. Second down and three at the 26 yard line. And close to a first, and he might have it with the slide is Dudek. Frank, can it get to the point where, like hitting a golf ball, if if you're worried about slicing, you know you're going to slice it. Now Dudek's Dropped it a couple times tonight. I, can you overcompensate and keep coughing it up? A running back, it just compounds itself. You start to think about it. But more than that, the defensive unit starts to think about it with you. And instead of going for the tackle, they're starting to grab that football. And you get a reputation for being a fumbler. It does compound itself because they're always tackling the football. Good point. Street shoes on. Blue jeans and sweatshirts were the order of the day. I, yeah. They weren't <laughs> sure they were going to be here tonight. Third down inches at the 23 quarterback draw and on the keeper he takes the ball for a first but a flag is down and a little uh, scuffle nine times out of ten when it comes from the umpire you know what it's going to be holding Denver I would assume if not some sort of a procedure call yeah. but holding it is what is it on the tenth time out of ten it's always holding no it could be a false start yeah. Holding. Still third down. The tenth time will be him seeing one of the guards coming up out of his stance a little in the den. <laughs> <laughs> they came from all directions when he did that. Third and 11 shotgun from the 33 yard line. And going <laughs> nowhere. Bill Pickell gets credit for that tackle. Bill Pickell, one of those who crossed the line, and we mentioned at the top, the Raiders came very, very close a week ago Friday to all reporting as a unit. I think we have to, in all fairness, point out that neither Bill Pickell nor Howie Long is a factor in this ball game at all. That's right. The Denver offensive line is, is controlling these two all-pro players, and how often have we seen that? The veterans, their first week back in, Really haven't made much of an impact. Certainly saw that with Mark Gastineau and the Jets in a couple of games. 
Ralph Jack Amaro to punt Calhoun. Won't have a chance to run this one back. As it's angled for the sideline. And they'll bring it out to the 11-yard line. 9.50 to play in the third. The Broncos lead by ball at their own 11. You might have been wondering, I mentioned the Raiders almost came across the line a week ago Friday, and you might say, well, why didn't they come last week? And in effect, what happened was Brian Holloway, now a Raider, and George Martin, the Giants player rep, came out and talked to the Raiders. But you'll recall a week and a half ago, Pakel and Long did come across and then went back out, and then just those two came back and Lester Hayes this week, and he's on injured reserve. And that's another story we'll get into later. First and 10, Raiders from the 11-yard line. Vince Evans going deep and underthrowing, and it almost is complete, but Carl Aiken sliding down, couldn't hold on to it. Second down. Second down and 10. Well, our crack staff has come up with an interesting little Sherlock Holmes discovery. Denver, take a look at their first half possessions. That's at the end of the half. They had a first and 10 incomplete, second and 10 nine-yard pickup. Then there was the offsetting penalties, then two incomplete passes. And we have confirmed it through our study as Horton takes it out to the 12-yard line that, in effect, Denver was able to kick that field goal on fifth down. There it is again. Now, they had first and 10 at the 22. Karcher's pass to Brown was incomplete. Then on second and 10, Karcher's pass to Massey was good for nine. That made it third and one. Then there was that play with the offsetting penalties. Third and one again. There was an incomplete pass. Then there was another incomplete pass on fourth and one. And Clendenin kicks the field goal on what amounts to fifth down. Well, look second from the bottom. The fourth and one from the 13. The chains and the scoreboard were actually showing third and one. Mm -hmm. Could certainly help your offense. Boy, I tell you, third down and eight. Evans to the 20 and slides down at the 26-yard line. And a first down. What a weapon he is in these kinds of games. There's no way they can change that, of course. And that right now is the differential. Yep. Broncos leading. 17 to 14. There was confusion at the time. I remember sitting here and calling the play. The scoreboard was not in sync with the down marker. And then you had that, the, the offsetting penalties, and that created some confusion. And as it turns out, they ran five plays instead of four. And instant replay is not applicable after the fact. First and 10 at the 26 yard line. And this is Craig Ellis out to the 31. Then again, though, when you think about it, in a way, had Denver known and had they been right and fourth down, the, the field goal attempt would have come from just about the same spot to begin with. Yeah, they would have kicked it if they would have known it was fourth down, right. but the chains were showing third and one. The scoreboard was showing third and one, mm -hmm. so they got the extra down, and mm -hmm. in reality, no one working the game discovered the error. It was our people working the computer who actually discovered that there were five downs involved. Isn't that amazing, the faith we have in that yard marker? Both coaches looking at it, nobody complaining. Yeah. Second down and five from the 31. And Ellis has a first down. But you know, the more you think about it, at least it wasn't a, a major play to the extent that it truly gave them the opportunity to continue a driver to get closer when, in fact, the extra play was simply an incomplete pass. Yeah, hardly comparable, say, uh, you know, I think back to the Super Bowl between the Patriots and the Bears when the Bears got that field goal right at the end of the first half where that never would have happened if the mistake wouldn't have been made down on the field. I think you've got to make the point here that they just kicked the field goal from exactly the same position without the extra down. In right. This, you know, in this end of the field. So, but still, a mistake is a mistake. First down from the 37-yard line. And Craig Ellis picks up a yard, maybe two. It'll be second and eight. We have 6.45 to play in the third period. Broncos on top by three. I think if there's any major surprise tonight, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, is the fact that the Raiders are not being able to run the football like they felt they could with that big offensive line, particularly those two 
good football players over the right side the veteran Steve Wright and the number two draft pick Bruce Wilkerson at right guard second down and eight from the 38 yard line Evans oh what a shot incomplete Aikens took a hellacious hit by Roger Jackson and says I'll sit this one out Jackson totally unloaded on Aikens let's look at it again Vince Evans put it up high well that's the key Aikens goes for it and takes the shot right there and they continue to look at Aikens he appeared like he was going to get up for a moment and then he rolled over and he remains on the turf here in Denver. As player resumes it was Aikens fortunately getting up and you saw him as we went to a commercial get up and trot off the field so there he is apparently none the worse for wear another look now he was very fortunate this ball hung up high and that is the blow delivered by Roger Jackson he zeroed in on the head totally forgetting about the football third down eight shotgun with Evans from the 38 yard line Vince has time and incomplete and even had that pass been come or it is the second receiver Ethan Horton number 23 out at the 45 yard line <laughs> they're, they're, they're Lathan, ruling it complete yet yeah, Lathan was the first guy making the catch after Horton was the intended receiver I wonder who was the intended receiver they were right on a line that rarely happens right through the hands of Horton and right into the arms of Lathan. Tell you something about the velocity of that ball thrown by Vince Evans. Talk about setting up for a relay. <laughs> Missed the cutoff man, get the other guy. At the 45 yard line, a first down for the LA Raiders. 17 to 14 Broncos five minutes and 58 seconds to play third quarter Horton flag Ethan unable to get on track tonight Ray Woodard number 99 making the tackle I think there was some movement on the left side of the Raider offensive line Offense number 61. Ball start before the snap. There's no play. Five yards. John Tautolo. Another veteran up on that line over on the left side. Tautolo has been around New England in 81 with the Giants a couple of years in the USFL. They've got a lot of experience along that line. First down 15 at the 50 yard line. Evans throwing and into traffic complete and then a fumble at the 27 yard line by Ron Wheeler. And no signal yet from the officials. Evans got hit by Boyer as he threw. And at the bottom of the pile, Denver. Evans did his job. He threaded the needle into that zone. Wheeler had split the seam. And here it is. Right between two defenders. And Wheeler. We'll have the ball literally stripped by Tim Lucas. And the Broncos get the recovery from Leonard Jones. First and 10, Denver at the 27 yard line. Parker on a roll to the left, throwing to Micho, and he's rolled out at the 30 yard line after a gain of four with five minutes and 34 seconds. 
remaining in the third period. Don Shula before, we've talked to Tech Tram and to Pat Bolin, and we're gonna hear from Coach John Robinson of the Los Angeles Rams. Second down and seven from the 30-yard line. Gain of five for Dudek. Well, John Robinson in Southern California, your assessment now of the first two weeks of replacement play, your team beating the Steelers yesterday, 31-21. Well, it was a big win for us. We really had to have it just to stay in the hunt. Uh, I think the gap is closing on those teams that didn't return players that have been in their training camp. We were one of those teams that didn't have a lot of players come back, and uh, we were in trouble the first week, but uh, those gaps are narrowing now, so I think it's gonna be more, com more competitive as it goes along. Third down and one, and picking up the first down is Nathan Poole, first down. John Frank Gifford, you are one and three, one of the favorites in the Western Division of the NFC going in. Had to be a major disappointment. I know you share that disappointment with so many coaches, but it had to be a major disappointment. You had put this team together, and it looked like it was very solid, a contender for the past few years, and it must have been a big disappointment for you. Well, it certainly is. I mean, uh, to get off to that bad a start and then have the thing change uh, was difficult for us. But, you know, we're two games off the pace now, you know, so we're still in the hunt. So you, the wind kind of excites us again, and uh, we're anxious to get the whole thing finished and get back to the regular season. From the 40-yard line, it's cool again. To the 46-yard line he goes. John, I would have to think a lot of coaches and coaching staffs were hopeful this thing would be over in a hurry and, I think some had a, a difficult time really getting into it. Now that it's gone on for a couple of weeks and may go on for a while longer, is there a different attitude and philosophy amongst the coaching staffs? Oh, I think so. I think we're all living day to day. You know, the, there was that optimism that we all shared and it kept, we were, we were kind of beaten down because of it. You know, you, you'd be up one day and then down the next. Uh, uh, but I think everybody's just kind of focused on just trying to survive through this week's game and get this team, whoever it is, uh, to play as well as they can. Second and four from the 46-yard line, and it is Dudek moving through the middle across the 50 to the 48-yard line. John, is there any, any way you can tell how many Rams might be on your team if this strike were to end tomorrow? How many of the replacement players you would keep? Well, we would certainly consider some. Uh, I'm not sure how many. I think it's one thing to see pl a player compete against uh, equals, but then to see him compete against uh, what we would consider uh, the, the veteran, solid NFL player, uh, I'm not so sure. I think there'll be a grace period there where we get a chance to look at some of those people when and if this thing ever is solved. This is Dudek on first and 10, and Dudek on an impressive Denver drive, gets the first down and a penalty marker as well at the end of the play. And John Robinson, we thank you. Thank you. Ron Washington came in with a tackle up around the head on Dudek's break around left end. Defense, number 91, personal foul, face mask, 15 yards. Ronnie Washington. Well, there's the five-yard variety, which is the unintentional. There's the... 15-yard variety, which is the intentional and the flagrant, and that's what Ron Washington gets tagged with. Dudek breaks the Raider contain, and, well, that's a two-handed face mask job right there, and that's that's how a player gets a serious neck injury. Dudek spun away from it, actually even stayed in bounds, and Ronnie Washington tacks 15 onto an already good Denver drive. Broncos, 17-yard line. Scott Caldwell, who played a key role last week, at least he carried the ball a lot, but has been silent tonight, is stopped by Ronnie Washington. Caldwell out of University of Texas at Arlington, carried 10 times for 30 yards last week against Houston, but that's his first carry tonight. Dudek has done all most of the ball carrying tonight. He's carried 17 times for 93 yards, and he has scored both Bronco touchdowns. Three minutes to go in the third quarter. Caldwell had started off the field, and Karcher had to call him back. Second and nine. Dumped off to Michaud. Tackled at the 10 by Ron Foster. It'll be third and about two. Well, what a nice read that time by Karcher. Keith Browner came in on the blitz, and 
that linebacker is unaccounted for. It was play action going away from it. Karcher rolls right into him and has to make a snap decision. And that time he read it properly and quickly and delivered a, a good strike. This is an impressive drive by Denver. This is they're showing a great deal of poise. This doesn't look like the same team that played a week ago. Third and a short three. Shotgun. Pressure into the end zone. Touchdown. Rick Messi, who caught one last week against Houston. He did a fine job of getting open, got to the back of the end zone, got between the two defenders, and Karcher, who got terrific protection, was able to get it off from the shotgun. Look at the bottom of your screen. The block by Stuttered, he's a veteran, working against Howie Long. The Raiders have moved him to the right side, but it was Stuttered who kept Long out of the face of Karcher, and he was able to get it in. High snap, and thus May has to improvise, and it's intercepted, and that's the end of the play. There's no run back on an extra point. David Jones, the snapper, with a high snap. So they settle for six. We've got 2.01 to go in the third quarter at Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado. The Broncos now lead 23 to 14. Michaels with Frank Gifford and Dan Deardorf. 2.01 to play in the third quarter. Broncos have just scored. They lead 23 to 14, and Mike Clendenin to kick off. And he's had long kickoffs tonight, and another one to the goal line, Rick Calhoun, who ran a punt back for a touchdown. Takes it after the 18, stopped by Darrell Russell. And that's where the Raiders will begin. So the Raiders had fought their way into a 14-14 tie, but now they are down by nine. 152 to play in the third quarter. L.A. at its own 18-yard line. Evans. And nearly intercepted. That was Roger Jackson, the man who really delivered the hit on Carl Aikens earlier. And this time Aikens was again the intended receiver. Aikens and Jackson have met before. And Aikens is lucky to still be in the ballgame. Seen a lot of players leave, take a game or two off after a blow like that. Second and 10, Raiders from their own 18-yard line. Bronx lead by nine. Craig Ellis knifes his way out to the 24-yard line. It'll be third and four. One thing about the Raiders, they have so much confidence in their ability to come back and play well in the fourth quarter. You're not seeing any panic. You're not seeing any change from their basic game plan, which includes a lot of running between the tackles. Raider football is to soften up the defense and make big plays in the fourth quarter to win the game. I don't think Tom Flory is going to change now. On third and four, pressure, and Evans escapes the sack and throws, and it's complete for a first down at the 33-yard line. Craig Ellis and the nimble one, Evans, avoiding the sack. Jeff Tupper had Vince Evans right in his arms, and Evans skipped out. I've seen him almost call in the arms and flag it right there. In less time than that. Well, that's where the mobile quarterback gets mm -hmm. a break. He does get a break. They don't call it nearly so quickly. First and 10, L.A. from the 33. Set up the screen. Jim Brown. Hit down at the 37-yard line by Jim Ryan on what should be the final play of the penultimate period. Third quarter coming to a climax. Dan Reeves stalking the sidelines and angered over what he felt was a non-call by an official. End of three. If you look at Flores, Denver leads by nine. We'll return to Mile High Stadium after this word about an upcoming show on ABC and a word from your local team before a big and very enthusiastic crowd at Mile High Stadium as this fourth weekend of NFL play comes to a climax. So here we go in the fourth quarter. 
Second down and eight. Raiders at their own 35-yard line. Carl Akins is the man in motion. Vince Evans, the QB. Wide open and into Bronco territory is David Williams for a first down out of Illinois. David Williams. Well, remember before we told you about the extra play that the Broncos got at the end of the first half and it resulted in a field goal, which gave them a 17-14 lead. And what we've done is we have strung those plays together for you visually and we'll weave it in between plays and you can see exactly what happened. Meanwhile, first and 10, Los Angeles at the 44. Horton. And he still can't get on track, just a couple of yards. Now, here's the deal. It was first and 10 for Denver. That much time, 50 seconds left. Here's the first and 10 play. This is the end of the first half. And Karcher out of the shotgun, intended for Leron Brown. That's incomplete, okay? It's second down and 10 now with 42 seconds. This was the second and 10 play. He goes to Massey. He makes the catch. And it's third down and one at that point. Third and one. There was the clock running down. And then this. This was the offsetting penalty call. Offsetting penalties. Now we're back live for the moment. We'll pick it up. This is live action on second down and seven. Evans flushed and incomplete. And it will be third down. And a penalty marker goes down. Kirk Dodge came in. And he'll probably be the guilty party. No question about that. There was no receiver even remotely in the area where Vince Evans threw that football. Offense, number 11. Intentional grounding. Loss of a down. Huh. From the spot of the pass. Intentional grounding. All right, so it's against the Raiders. All right, now to pick up. Remember, it's third down and one as we pick it up after the offsetting. 19 seconds to go in the first half. This is truly the third and one play. Karcher tries to hit Massey in the end zone incomplete. So now it's fourth and one. It is now fourth and one. But they've got third and one on the down box and on the scoreboard. And this pass from Micho was incomplete. And so now on fifth and one, the field goal. <laughs> there you have it. We're live again on third down and a mile. And it's caught at the 50-yard line by Rick Calhoun, but he's out of bounds well shy of the first down, shy by seven. Earl Johnson covering. Did you get the feeling you did that once before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing that nobody picked up on that yep. until after the halftime. 61,230. That is the biggest crowd by far, by 50%, because the biggest in the two weeks was the... The 40-plus at Dallas yesterday, 61-230 tonight at Mile High. Shane Swanson to receive back at the 10. Vince Gamache to do the kicking. And out of bounds it goes at about the 13-yard line. Next drive commences there, 13-49, remaining in the fourth. Brox by nine. Broncos have it at their own 12-yard line. Raiders and Bronx by quarters. And now, of course, Denver with zero. It's their first possession as we start the, the fourth period. 13.49 to go in the quarter. It's their first possession of the fourth and from the 12-yard line. Dudek takes it out to the 15. We have Carl Mecklenburg of the Broncos available to us. And Carl... I am curious as to your re reaction to the fact last week, by far the biggest crowd in the NFL, and tonight 61,000 show up at Mile High. Carl, I'm sure you heard uh, the statement of Gene Upshaw that we played at the beginning of the telecast and then further elaborated at halftime. Your reaction to that, Carl? You're the assistant player rep at the Denver Broncos. Your reaction?
Meanwhile here Dean May has now come into the game Ken Karcher holding his hand and coming off and so it is Dean May who takes over at quarterback on third down and seven from the 16 yard line and it's May out of the shotgun and he it was a forward pass an incomplete forward pass and so it will be fourth down and there is the hand of Karcher being worked on what do you what do you suspect Carl will happen give us a sense of what you think the Broncos will do this week if this strike continues will there be a lot of defections will the whole team come across or just what well the way we've approached this whole strike is we're going to stay out as a team or we're going to go in as a team and uh, we've had votes along the way to, to make sure where we all stand so if a majority of the players decide we're going to go back in it'll be the whole team back in. Carl, this is Dan Deardorff. Do you have another vote scheduled anytime soon? Yeah, we do. Every time something changes or the the, uh, the situation dictates it, we uh, we do have a vote, and it's just to reassure ourselves that we're all on the same page. I don't anticipate us going back in, but if uh, the majority of my teammates decide to go back in, I'll be the first guy back. Carl, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ralph Jackamaro will do the kicking now on fourth down for the Broncos. He stands at the goal line. Rick Calhoun, who's run one back for a score, will let this one bounce, and then he picks it up, and he's lucky he didn't fumble it. Out of bounds at the 35-yard line. So from there, will the Raiders begin? 12.53 to go in the fourth quarter. It's Denver on top. Raiders take over at their own 35-yard line. First and 10. L.A. down by nine. Too high intended for Ron Wheeler and a dislocated finger is the report from the bench on Karcher. I think he actually gets it in some hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, combat with Pickell. Watch the follow-through as Karcher throws the ball. He's going to hit Bill Pickell's right hand. There's where the dislocation comes as Karcher falls backwards and shakes it in pain. It was just right up on the hand of Bill Pickell. <laughs> the passing hand, but if you keep that ice down, there's a good possibility he could play even next week. Second and 10, Raiders from the 35-yard line. And it's Carl Akins making the catch. And enough for a first down. So the Raiders down by nine. Again, a very important game in terms of the standings. Make what you want of what's happening in the NFL, but they do keep standings and the games do count. And for the Broncos, a very important game. As they come in 1-1-1, one, one, and one, the Raiders 3-0. A little extra roar, the crowd applauding themselves as the crowd of 61,200-plus is put up on the scoreboard here. First and 10 at the 46-yard line. Evans. And the catch is made, and so is the tackle at the 46-yard line. Craig Ellis, no game. The only thing in fairness that I think we must point out when they flash up tonight's attendance of 61,000-plus is that the Broncos did give away a certain number of tickets uh, to tonight's ball game. They had a program with some local schools here in the community, and reports of between six and 10,000 tickets were distributed at no charge. So that attendance figure here tonight is somewhat artificial by whatever that figure is. But any way you look at it, it's a 50,000 plus paid, which is pretty unbelievable. Very. Second down and 10 from the 46 yard line. And the catch is made by Craig Ellis at the 49. It's interesting to look at the teams that were home last week and also yesterday. Atlanta was, and their attendance went down to 8,000 yesterday. New England's attendance went down as well. The Giants went from uh, 12 and change to 9. Seattle was up, and Denver is the fifth team, and Denver at 38 last week, and they lost. They got blown away and still come back with, as Dan said, 61 total and 50 or so paid tonight. Well, the economics of a crowd of over 50,000, considering the payments, salary payments that are dramatically reduced, are certainly a plus factor even though the game is 
probably being dramatically affected by the fact that the replacement players are here. Third and six, and it's incomplete intended for David Williams. Boy, and Darrell Russell played that beautifully. When Williams made his break to the post, Russell anticipated it. Let's look at it. Man coverage all the way, bump and run. Breaking to the inside, the ball now is thrown back behind. It wasn't a good pass at all from Evans, but again, Russell had the good inside out position, was able to react back to the poorly thrown pass. Gamash the kick, and Casey Clark will call for the fair catch at the 13 yard line. Broncos get it back. We have 10 minutes and 14 seconds remaining in the fourth. Denver by nine. Coming in. Other players are not coming in. That acrimony is going to exist for a long time. I don't think there's going to be a loss of fan interest nearly the magnitude of what we saw in 82 because the games are continuing. I mean, it was cold turkey for two months back in 1982. Uh, granted, uh, this is not the caliber of football you would see if these were the regular Broncos and the regular Raiders. But nonetheless, 61,000 people are here staying involved in the game of football. I think that's the biggest difference between 1987 and 1982. And of course, much will depend on what we find out later, how many people watch this tonight on television. Yeah. Right. The Broncos have gone to yet another quarterback with Monty McGuire now in there, seeing his first NFL action. And this is McGuire completing a pass to Micho. And a first down out of the 25-yard line. So Monty McGuire out of Texas Tech. He actually did. He played very briefly last week through one incomplete pass. He was in the Broncos training camp this season. Monty McGuire. And don't underestimate what a plus that is. That's Rob Harrison of the Raiders, a running back who separated his shoulder early in the game. Now, Dean May has come back in as quarterback. So much for McGuire for the moment. First and 10 from the 25. And through the middle goes Dudek to the 38-yard line. May is another down. player that was in the Broncos camp this summer. Actually, he was a fifth-round pick of Miami back in 1984. And he was cut there, and then he went with the Eagles. He was cut by the Eagles, and he tried to make it once again this year with Denver. Again, Joe Dudek doing what he does best, running between the tackles, good body lean, head down, shoulders forward, straight ahead football. And that is the kind of football you want to play when you have a nine-point lead like the Broncos do right now. First and ten, Broncos from the 38-yard line. Dudek again. And he gets five out to the 43, and he takes some more time off the clock, which is now down to eight and a half minutes. I'm sure that Danny Reeves would like to continue to work on that clock, maintaining that lead. I don't think he has the confidence, certainly does not have the confidence in May that he does in Karcher. May was 0 for 4 last week. But the man who has really done the work tonight has been Joe Dudek, even though he's fumbled a couple of times. 5-8 average. He has changed the offense of the Denver Broncos dramatically tonight. The Broncos, meanwhile, going with alternating quarterbacks now. McGuire and May, and this is May. It's his turn, and it's Dudek out to the 46-yard line. Now, May looks over at the bench. McGuire is standing there with Reeves. Of course, where did Dan Reeves learn this little trick? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he is sending the play in with the quarterback. In fact, the guy that used to sit up here used to be one of those trotters in and out, right? That's Meredith, right. Yeah. Meredith used to shuttle plays in and out for Dallas. Oh, he loved that. <laughs> Third down and three. I figured I'd better bring his name up. It seemed like you two forgot. Oh, no, we remembered. <laughs> we were just turning out the lights, that's all. Poole. And Poole at the 49. Pool, the other veteran running back in there for Denver, did what Dudek did a moment ago. He put his head down and he got the necessary yardage for the first. Keeps that clock moving. First down. Actually, Frank was just, he was trying to think of all the guys that have, <laughs> that have been through here and <laughs> roll the decks with spinning. <laughs> Solid point. For 
Dean May, the quarterback, on this play from the 49-yard line. Nathan Poole is behind him. And Rick Massey in motion. And Nathan Poole finds the hole and takes it to the 42-yard line. Meanwhile, our cameras are everywhere in Minneapolis tonight. The celebration goes on and on and on as the Minnesota Twins clinch the American League pennant in Detroit. And <laughs> as fate would have it, we've got 14,000 remotes going tonight, and we just lost the satellite. But we'll get it back, and we'll give you a feel of what's taking place in the Twin Cities tonight. Second down and one at the 42-yard line. Monty McGuire, quarterback of the moment. And he hands the ball off to Scott Caldwell. And Caldwell has a first down at the 37-yard line. Pickell and Long, two big names on the Los Angeles Raider defensive line are the ultimate non-factors in this football game. The Denver Broncos with a seemingly outclassed offensive line until Brian and Stuttert get here are manhandling the Raiders up front. The Raiders are in a situation desperate to get the football back, and I don't see a whole lot of desperate activity on their side of the ball. 38-yard line. And it's Dudek taking it to the 35. Meanwhile, moments ago, this was the scene in Minneapolis. There it is at the hump at the uh, Humphrey Metrodome itself. This celebration. There are the twins. There's Gary Gaetti in the foreground as the twins come home, get off their plane from Detroit, and are paraded around in in that arena that the other night just blew me away. Listening to those two games from Minneapolis, those people went crazy from from top to bottom. The Homer Hankies are out in force. Yeah. Second down and seven from the 34-yard line. McGuire to Michel. And Michel has a first down at the 21-yard line. Bobby Michel, good Denver drive as they try to salt it away. Sixth reception of the night for Michel. Remember we talked before about motion and how it disturbs. Look at Bobby Michaud. He's come all the way across the formation. Is going to come out, and there's not going to be any Raider anywhere out in the defensive secondary. The motion is really screwing up the Raiders and their defensive coverage. We saw it in the first half. And a touchdown pass. Michaud in motion is too much for the Raiders. First and 10 from the 22-yard line. Dudek. One thing to look for on a defensive team is how many guys other than the tackler end up on the ball carrier. It's an old football saying as we watch Joe Dudek come off, and if anybody's earned a rest, he has. But how many hats are being put on the ball carrier? And right now, the only Raider helmets on a ball carrier are the guys that are making the tackle. And as you so often point out, you see that offensive line just blowing the Raiders out of there. Dudek only goes about 190 pounds, but he was following the surge of that offensive line. He got seven yards out of it. Second down and three from the 15-yard line. Poole. And stop inside the one. That crack back block again by Rick Massey, number 83, coming in motion. Taking a crack back at the nose tackle that is twice now is sprung. Big plays for the Broncos. The big horses are pulling the plow right here. Look at the opening up front. The Raiders are just simply and cleanly being blown off the football by the Denver Broncos. By those big uglies in the trenches. It's not that fancy a game. When my big people beat up on your big people, my team's going to win. First and goal. Pool. Touchdown. Broncos made it look easy. They just were out hitting the Raiders on that entire drive. They were working on the clock. And they came away with six on it.
Who wins it up front? Not a whole lot of white shirted penetration and Nathan Poole doesn't even have to get his jersey dirty on that play. Freeman and Stuttered, Brian, Hood, Carts. Granted, I'm a little partial to offensive linemen, but I think it's obvious that even the most casual observer, they're getting it done. Glenn Denning. The 61,000. Very happy at the moment. The Broncos appear to have salted it away. 30 to 14. Denver Miami on August the 24th Dudek fumbles and it probably cost them a job with the team and then there's tonight seven weeks later and a couple of fumbles tonight and he bounced back with a 128 yard game some pretty good running backs who aren't included in that Floyd Little comes to mind Otis Armstrong Rob Lytle 19 yard line it's picked up by Ronnie Washington and the linebacker does his thing but not too well the 91s are not too graceful running back kickoffs meanwhile next week from Irving Texas it'll be the Washington Redskins and the Dallas Cowboys on Monday Night Football where White and Dorsett and company have already come back that's nine Eastern time and then in the NFC East, there are the standings at the moment, so it's a battle for the top spot. And the Giants, of course, are 0-4. Dallas and Washington both undefeated during their strikes, during the strike. Can you imagine a Giants-Washington game drawing 9,000 people as it did yesterday? From the 18-yard line, Evans intended for Horton and picked off. Uh -huh. Lucas, Tim Lucas. Out of the University of California, he's had a big night. We've called his name a lot. And that'll go down against Vince Evans as the interception. That'll count against him, but hardly his fault. A pretty well-delivered pass by Vince Evans to Ethan Horton, who has the ball and just... I believe it bounces right off of him up to Lucas. I mean, that's one of those where the quarterback takes the heat for it, but he couldn't have thrown that ball any better to Horton, who just plain served it up on a silver platter to Timmy Lucas. What an alert move it was, too. You saw it there. Just pulling it off, off the turf just before it made contact. I don't think he's had any professional experience, Tim Lucas, University of California. Yep. He uh, graduated a, a few years back. He hasn't been in football. He graduated with a degree in economics from Berkeley. Well, he's got professional experience. He started last week. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and had one tackle and two assists. Meanwhile, they're checking upstairs. It appeared plain as could be from the reverse angle. I mean, I guess the only determination could be if it hits the ground. Well, they've checked and oh, it stays. It yeah. stays. First and ten from the 20. And that's Scott Caldwell using up the clock, and that's going to take us down to the two-minute warning. And it would appear, gentlemen, that after tonight, there is only one undefeated team in the National Football League, the yeah. Chicago Bears. And wouldn't you know it, the Chicago Bears. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. 120 seconds remaining on the clock. Two minutes to go in Denver, where the Broncos have a comfortable lead over the Raiders. Watching his team, an underdog as far as uh, experts or amateurs, almost anybody is concerned. The Raiders certainly came in favored based upon what had happened last week, but Tom Flores watching his team go down. 30 to 14, Broncos. Daniel, Sir Daniel, what do you got for us? Well, friends, pull up a chair while I tell you that this telecast is presented by the authority of the National Football League. It is intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or any other use of this telecast without the express written consent of the National Football League is directly prohibited. <laughs> okay, you can get back up now. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Second down and six at the 17-yard line. Broncos chewing up the clock, and it's Joe Dudek 
Taking it down to the 12. And it'll be third down and one. A reminder tonight on Nightline in the wake of a massive march on Washington by gay Americans, a look at how age has intensified the fight for equal rights by homosexuals. That's the topic tonight on Nightline following your late local news. There is a marker down in the last play in the penalties against Denver. Moving it back to the 22-yard line. We want to credit Joe Castellano of our crack crew for discovering that five-down situation. And our thanks to the boys in the booth, as always, George Hill and Malibu Kelly Hayes, Steve Hurt, the whole gang downstairs. Second down and 11. To the 18. Jamie Kimmel making the tackle. And again, a reminder, a college doubleheader, national doubleheader. You see both games, Iowa against Michigan. USC takes on Washington. It starts at 12 Eastern time Saturday. And what a big day of sports because the first game of the World Series will come your way from Minneapolis at 8 Eastern time Saturday night. Games 1 and 2 in the Twin Cities. And then next week, games 3, 4, and 5 in either Candlestick Park or Bush Stadium. Another penalty against the Broncos takes it back to the 32. Looking down the road, we are going to be watching Denver on November the 16th. They are scheduled against the Bears. The Raiders will see November the 30th against Seattle. Second down and 21. Monty McGuire is the quarterback. Scott Caldwell. Well, you, you're watching these alternating quarterbacks. Reminds me of our, our man Chris Schenkel. As Schenk might say, last week Walsh runs the wishbone, and this week Reeves alternates quarterbacks. The color and pageantry of pro football. <laughs> and this is the downside of pro football as an injured Raider, Ron Foster, is being attended to. Ron Foster is a very interesting story, like so many of the stories of these players that make up these alternative teams or whatever we call them Ron Foster was a security guard with the Raiders on the sidelines last year out of Cal State Northridge but he was working for the Raiders getting experience I guess you could say as a security guard on the sidelines and he's all right Coming in to make the tackle, puts his hat right in there, and that's just an old-fashioned bell ringer. He's okay. <laughs> Third down and 15, the ball at the 26-yard line. Broncos are going to be 2-1-1, one and, one, and the Raiders are going to be 3-1, and one, along with San Diego. Caldwell to the 22 yard line and timeout is taken here by Los Angeles now when this one is done it'll be the Raiders in San Diego at three and one Denver right there half a game back Seattle back by a game and Kansas City a team uh, that appears to be in big trouble with their strike unit getting bombed yesterday 42 nothing at Miami in last and Denver will be going to Kansas City next week and Denver looking awfully strong tonight. Two weeks and since the strike and that's how they they've stacked up. You notice there's nobody in the middle of the road. It's the haves and the have nots. Yeah. Can you imagine that the way it breaks down not a single one and one. There are oh, there are one and one teams. 14 now you got 14 one and one teams. 7, 14 in the middle. I interpreted that graphic pretty well. Yeah, you're that's real good stuff. You'd never know that there's only a minute and a half left in this game. Good night, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> After I read the disclaimer, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> and when Bennett has his kick block. And the Raiders will take over with a minute and 23. You know, one thing we haven't touched on tonight, Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson working out in Alabama. 
quoted today, I understand, is saying uh, and he's coming west. Now, whether he's coming west across a picket line or what, but we'll see about Bo Jackson and the L.A. Raiders. Well, his initial statements as of two weeks ago when the strike originated was that there's no way that I'm going to cross the picket line, that I'll honor the strike like any other Raider veteran. Uh, who's choosing to stay out now? I think uh, doubly so the fact that he is also a member of the Baseball Players Association. I think it would be uh, even that much more of an impact. I wonder how much longer he's going to be a member of the Baseball Players Association. Ball is used to strikes, that's for sure. Three of them. <laughs> I don't know that that would be. The best way to join the Raiders if I was Bo Jackson to immediately come in he's already stirred up somewhat of a controversy and calling football a hobby and some of his various quotes I I don't know that's the way to endear himself to his teammates for some sort of a long range career with the Raiders by walking right in and crossing yeah. a picket line. Well that's what I was trying to bring up before there's a talking uh, about the block kick here. When we uh, when I brought up before Frank the long term effect we discussed what it might be in terms of the fans but what about in terms of the players themselves and getting back to uh, as you look at the replay booth the team unity aspect and, and getting their minds back on what they're there to accomplish Frank, try to accomplish. Let's take a look one more time at this. Uh, deflected kick. Deflected by Cormier and then covered up in the end zone. And it's pr really much ado about nothing, uh, but they have to go through the paces here. 30 to 14 is the score. Well, they're trying to determine whether to spot the ball at the 20 or up at the 22. They've chosen to spot it at the 22 yard line. Okay. That's. <laughs> As a certain voice on a radio show in L.A. goes, okay. <laughs> That's like that last graphic. <laughs> From the 22-yard line, Evans to Ethan Horton makes the catch. Clock continues to run. Raiders down to one timeout. <laughs> Second and four. Ellis fumbles and in the air and back the other way inside the 20. This is Leonard Jones. Oh, 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 what a like way a, to end it. Looked like a lateral. Leonard Jones. Craig Ellis just running with the football. Miraculously just tosses it up in the air right to Jones. Again, Vince Evans is there with the ball, but watch this. Does it hit his hip? Sure does. Bounces right up off of his thigh pad, right into the arms of Leonard Jones. <laughs> That'd be hard to do if you rehearsed it. Hmm. Fifth turnover. There's Ellis. Who scored two touchdowns last week against Kansas City. He, yeah. play, he played in the CFL. Maybe that's a play in Canada. Maybe they might do that on purpose <laughs> up there. They run that inside the 55s. Vince Evans and the Raiders will fly home after the game, and their record will be three and one. They take on the San Diego next week at the Coliseum. And Denver travels to Arrowhead to meet Kansas City. Danny Rees a bit of a prophet when he told us that they would play much better tonight. He said that they would be a better football team blaming last week on himself. They were indeed that they were a much better football team this evening. So that's the story. At Denver Al Michaels Frank Gifford and Dan Deardorff. Good night from Mile High Stadium where the Broncos knock off the Raiders by a score of 30 to 14. This Saturday ABC Sports begins exclusive coverage 
of the World Series. The 84th World Series, Game 1, beginning live 8 Eastern Time Saturday, and we know we'll be in Minnesota where the Twins will host either the San Francisco Giants or the St. Louis Cardinals. Then next week, ABC's NFL Monday Night Football, an NFC East matchup as the Washington Redskins square off against the Dallas Cowboys, and that begins at 9 Eastern next Monday here on ABC Sports. And this has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television.